Hello and welcome to How to Start Up, a podcast for anyone starting a company in 2020. This is a collection of conversations with people who have all successfully started, run and even sold their own companies, sharing not only professional but personal experiences on what we should be doing now, next or never. In this episode, we hear from Ana Fernandez, founder of Mexican beauty brand Izapa. She talks through the hows and whys of her ambition to start up her own brand, having decided to leave her long-standing marketing director role with Chanel. She also notes how having an always-on approach to her business actually gives her far more freedom to spend time with her kids than any salary role would have allowed. Anna chats to us from Mexico City, where the broadband band is seemingly far better than that of Devon's. I'm convinced there was a cow chewing through the line at the time of recording, so apologies for the slightly interesting audio on this one. Hi, Anna. Hi. Nice to, nice to be here. Hello. I'd love it if you could start just by introducing yourself and your company and when you started it and potentially why you may have started it. Absolutely. So my name is Anna Fernandez. Um, I currently reside in Mexico City and I'm the founder of Isapa. And Isapa is a, is a Mexican brand. It's a brand of beauty and lifestyle products, which have been inspired by uh, my journeys and um, travels and exploration of Mexico. Amazing. When did you start it? Well, I've been in Mexico now for just around six years. Um, and I arrived in, in Mexico City, um, having spent more than a decade working in luxury fragrance and beauty for LVMH and then Chanel. Um, and I came to join my husband, who was based here. I arrived with no Spanish. I arrived not having ever been to Mexico, really. I mean, soon after coming here, I really felt this this kind of uh, desire to sort of open a new chapter. I'd, I'd left my job. I was in a new country. And I really wanted to kind of give myself a new challenge. And I, I really quickly realized that Mexico would be the perfect place to do that. How long did it take you from first idea to launch? Uh, that's a good question. Quite a while, I'll be honest. And the reason for that was because, uh, as I mentioned, I arrived here with no Spanish. All I could say was like, hola. And so it was quite daunting. I arrived and I was like, right, the first thing I need to do is learn the language. And actually, the good thing about that was it gave me the opportunity. It bought me time. I was learning the language. And at that time, I, I was, you know, spending, I was learning language every day, every morning, five days a week, quite intense. Um, and then in the afternoons, I started to slowly put together some ideas about what I wanted to launch myself. And because of the fact that the brand has been inspired by the exploration of this kind of wonderful country. So it was this, you know, I was traveling, I was discovering the country, I was learning about the culture, I was reading, I was starting to kind of create the first uh, picture of what the brand could look like. So it was quite a long period. And I think in many ways, that really helped me because I think that when you start to think about launching a new company, particularly if you're launching a brand um, with products and you know a, a brand story, you need to have it very, very clear in your mind um, and you need to get into the detail, meet the right people, meet the right suppliers um, and start to you know work on a plan. So the long and short of it is that actually it was probably a couple of years before I launched um, the company. Um, but that meant that I had, yeah, I had time to really go into all the detail I wanted to. I think we've talked about this for years, the school of training that we've both come through these luxury, well-established brands, that the execution is so important and the storytelling behind that execution is almost even more important than that. And I remember you moving to Mexico and saying exactly that of, I think I can do my own thing and I've had the best training to be able to do that, but I want to do it really, really well. So for you, the luxury was time to do that properly. Exactly. And I think you, you've really hit the nail on the head, you know, because you've worked at Chanel for as many years as me, probably longer. But you no, know, you're absolutely right. I think one of the most amazing things that Chanel taught us was not compromising on, on detail or quality, not doing anything until you're really confident that you're proud of it, that it's that it's on brand, that it makes sense, that it's not just, a, you're not just going for like a commercial win. And I have to say there were ways that we were trained that meant that, you know, you have to kind of learn new ways when you launch your own business because you're no longer under the umbrella of a big global brand. And when you start as a tiny brand, nobody knows you and 
you know, like it or not, you're kind of at the bottom of their pile. So it takes a lot more management, a lot more kind of chasing and follow up to get things done. And I found that particularly in Mexico, because that's another cultural difference that um, has been has been quite challenging for me. What is it you did first? It was really about the people I met. So very early on in the process, I, I met a perfumer who um, I then collaborated with. And he was part of, or he is part of, um, Roberté, which is one of the most uh, famous uh, fragrance houses, fine fragrance houses in France. And they have a, um, a subsidiary here in Mexico. And I explained the project to him. And he was delighted to do something from scratch and help me to, to build, you know, bring this kind of idea into reality. So I was working with him on the one hand. I also met um, a, a, a famous writer called Laura Esquivel, um, and she uh, wrote the, the book, more, mostly famous, I mean, translated in probably 40 languages, but most famous in Latin America, Como Agua para Chocolate. She loved the project. I explained to her what I was doing. It was just over a lunch. And she said, oh, I'd love to see how we could collaborate. So we started to um, work together to develop a series of poems to kind of take each customer on this kind of this viaje sensorial, this like sensorial journey through Mexico. So it was kind of using the talent, local talent, to also, I felt I really needed to understand better the, the Mexican culture. You know, I came along, I was British, I had a lot of experience, but I was trying to launch a brand in another country, and it was very key for me to to seek out local talent. Um, I worked with an artist who worked on my photographic sets, and I also, um, actually more earlier on, worked with an artisan um, who designed all the packaging for me, or, or at least designed a series of patterns that I then had vectorized and I worked with an agency to kind of create the packaging. So all those kind of, all that background work before even thinking about producing the product, um, there was loads at the beginning and that took a lot of time. And actually it was a great moment for me because it was, it was very, it was that kind of the creative part, I guess, of the process. The most important part was, yeah, meeting people um, and drawing upon local talent. What does it mean to you to run your own company now? You know, timing has been an interesting one for me because I arrived um, here and I actually launched the brand four months after giving birth to my first child. Um, so it was it was a very intense, 2017 was a very, very intense period. Um, I then went on to have another baby. So I've, I've been doing this kind of whilst being pregnant or having children. Um, and it's just been, you know, something I've juggled. And I think what I really, really um, have benefited from and I'm, I'm really glad I did I'm glad that I got it off the ground when I did because it was great to think right I've had a baby now I can get back into something keep something on the back burner I can get the flexibility um and not feeling like I'm kind of compromising too much on any part I think that's really key and that's what's kept me going and we've talked for years about I mean gosh we've known each other 15 years now I'd say um that we were always Anna from Chanel or Juliet from Chanel it was never Jules and Anna it, people like to associate you with the brand and you start to have that imposter syndrome keep creeping up on you of well what happens if I'm not with the brand then what and yeah and you can't imagine if you're in that you can't if, if you don't see us if you're sort of in a job and you don't see a reason to leave it you can't imagine what that would look like and I think it it is quite particular to um a brand like Chanel or a brand you know, it's, it's essentially, it's almost impossible for it not to define you to an extent because people are very, you know, immediately impressed by, oh, you work for Chanel, then go and do your own thing. And then you are defined by what you've achieved and what you've achieved single-handedly rather than, you know, being behind another brand. I'd love to know what you wouldn't do again if you could go back, if there is anything, or if indeed every mistake is actually being a benefit. I think if I had my time again, um, you know, my situation was quite unique in the sense that I couldn't have necessarily launched three or four months earlier because I was having a baby. But the idea that I could have, you know, launched, say I'd launched the year before, I could have launched with less product. I could have just gone for it. There was a hesitation of, I want to get this right. I want to do it well. And actually what you realize in the fullness of time is no one's really looking. You know, your friends and family might be looking at your website, but at the beginning, like no one's looking. <laughs> no one really cares in the sense that they want you to see you do well. But the fact that you launch five products or 10 products or, you know, it's important to get it out there because it's very easy to procrastinate. Success isn't, you know, just as simple as saying is the business, you know, making money or have you ticked certain boxes. It's very much every little milestone and, and celebrating those successes. So I probably would have said, you know, maybe launched a year before, 
launched smaller launched just online and believed in the fact that I did have a decent command of Spanish and the suppliers did know what I wanted but I think there was always that you know I'd, it took me a while to become really fluent and confident in Spanish and to go to a meeting and, and really under, explain what I was looking for or try and negotiate you know now I could do it fine but before it was it was a big deal you know going to supplier meetings with like a little scrap of paper with like my my key points in Spanish that was a big challenge for me. So don't build Rome in a day but you can build a bit of it. Exactly. It's important just to get yourself out there, but like balance that with making sure that you're proud of what you have and, you know, go for it. And what is it about running your own company that you enjoy the least? You know, you come from one or two disciplines in your career. I mean, I certainly did. I'm, my background is marketing. So, you know, I, my most recent job was marketing director. I had a team of people. Um, they were all very much in the detail of each brand. And, you know, I was able to have much more of a hands-off approach and suddenly you have your own your own brand and you've got to get back into that detail you've got to get back into the spreadsheet you've got to get back into the finance part and like it or not you've just got to do it you can't avoid that because it's important that at the beginning at least you you have a command of of each area um but, we, but in time you seek the help of the help of experts and so i think it's important to also accept the things where you're strong and where your value really counts and the areas where you might struggle for hours on something that someone else could help you with quickly. Uh, I've definitely every day in the last four or five months woken up and gone, hang on, I now need to be a web page designer. I don't know how to design the website. And then you have a go and you play around a bit and you understand it a little bit more. And then you know you, you can either do it and you know it's not going to be brilliant and therefore you are okay to outsource it because that's the best time and money spent to the external or you conquer it and you go hang on if I can do that what else can I do and it sort of builds your assurance and confidence that yeah you might not know how to do it this morning but by this afternoon you have a better idea and given you've gone from a global brand super successful you've risen through the ranks and achieved amazing things and you walked away from that and into a new country where do you seek that support that you would have had before from your colleagues or team members given that you're working on your own now my husband is a really great support with this whole project. At the beginning, he took a, a probably a slightly more hands-on approach and kind of pushed me a bit more to, to get it going and to move forward. And now he really is an amazing soundboard for, um, for lots of ideas, particularly creative ideas. And on top of that, um, so I have a mix of Mexican friends. I have a lot of French friends. I have fewer British friends. There are some. But lots of people who are here and lots of people who are trying their luck at creating something from scratch. And we, we talk a lot. We face the same issues. What is it about running your own company that you enjoy the most? My family is really important to me. The balance between family and work life, feeling like I'm succeeding in both. And I genuinely feel I'm succeeding in both, whether, you know, I could probably be doing better in, in both. But I, but I, I, feel, I feel comfortable with not neglecting one or the other. I'm happy I didn't stop working and just be just be at home with my children I'm also happy that I had children and that I can be here for them you know that I'm happy that I'm not still in a job where I'm traveling and I don't see them and I don't do their bath time every night and all those things and how do you structure your day or draw boundaries around work I think having children always give already gives you a good structure so you know we're up early we're up at six thirty, and breakfast is always at the same time every day and I start the day I sometimes fit in some some exercise that works quite well because, you know, I'm able to be here for them if they need me. And I'm also able to fit in the hours I do each day. It's also accepting that there is always going to be an overlap. If you work from home and your phone, you know, these days, the phone, you know, back in the day, we had like a Blackberry for work and a phone for personal stuff and you could divide, but it doesn't work. Well. So you could be looking at something to do with, you know, the kids or you could be something that receiving an email for work. But you're just on call. So while it works for me, it doesn't kind of it doesn't bother me to to to, to kind of keep that uh, slight overlap. What is your best advice for managing suppliers, say, or clients? It's follow up, follow up. You know, keep things moving. Don't assume that someone's working on your behalf unless you kind of know that they are. You need to follow up because otherwise, just you just get you get in that sort of situation of constantly feeling like things aren't moving and that's tough at the beginning because you can have days when you set up a business where nothing happens in a day or you feel like nothing's happening so you constantly have to be behind others super proactive proactive exactly so 
without the pandemic, obviously mm-hmm. you'd have been working to your plan and your marketing calendar, but with Zappa in the future, you've got 21 SKUs at the moment. So is there any exciting news coming up for new product? Yeah, I have I have a fourth range that I've already developed in terms of the concept. And so that's kind of ready to go and I'm waiting for the right timing. Um, I also have a fragrance that I'm working on. And on the side, I'm actually with my husband uh, renovating a, a hacienda in um, in the countryside to build a boutique hotel. So <laughs> we have another project which is going to be very much linked to my brand. Um, and I'm starting to work a lot more on that. It's busy and there's lots going on. Thanks, Anna, and best of luck with the new plans. I've been so lucky to work alongside Anna over the years and I'm delighted to see how well her brand at Zappo is doing with retailers as well as the swiftly growing DTC business. It has been really reassuring to hear from Anna that on some days it will feel like nothing is moving forward but to take a breath, keep on nudging things in the right direction and make sure I celebrate the small wins as I go. If you'd like to contact Anna and find out more about Zappa or the new Hacienda being restored in Mexico, you'll find all her details in the show notes along with a recap of the advice she has shared. Thank you for listening to How to Start Up, hosted by me, Juliet Fallowfield, founder of PR consultancy for startups Fallowfield and Mason. I hope these conversations offer you some confidence, encouragement and reassurance that you're on the right track. I would be delighted if you'd rate, review and share this podcast with anyone else who might be starting a company in 2020.